The time is now. The day is here. I made a Victorian corset. Can you tell I'm excited with how this turned out? This project is one that has been lurking in the recesses of my mind since I first started my historical costuming journey three years ago. It has also been the one type of project that has seemed insurmountable, far beyond my skill level, and impossible for me to ever achieve. There is so much fine-tuned fitting and structure that goes into corsetry, and my brain could not wrap its little head around the idea. Especially since I was looking at historical patterns versus a modern pattern from places like Simplicity or McCall's. Thankfully, I was able to find a pattern that took about 99% of the guesswork and mathing out of the process. I knew I wanted a late 1890s corset since most of my history bounding outfits are late 1890s to about 1910, and having a late 1890s corset would mean I could expand my wardrobe in both decades fairly well. And in my searching for patterns and research on construction methods, I came across the Pretty Housemaid corset by the Symington Company. The Pretty Housemaid is somewhat of a celebrity among historical corsets, and it was advertised as the strongest and cheapest corset ever made, and was primarily marketed toward young women in domestic service. This was a working woman's corset, designed to be supportive and shapely, but also comfortable and practical. This was not meant as a tight lacing corset, although it definitely gives the hourglass shape that was fashionable at the time. Now, while the Symington collection does have a number of their corset patterns available to purchase, this was one project where I definitely wanted to take the easiest road possible. And thankfully, I found that. Michelle of Clockwork Fairy has made a pattern for the Pretty Housemaid corset, which is really clear and straightforward. She offers two basic size ranges, and this corset does have a bit of wiggle room on sizing. If you want to spend a bit more money to make sure your mock-up really fits before diving into the real deal, she also offers a custom pattern option made to your measurements. My measurements are actually really close to the larger of base patterns, so I just opted for that. But if my measurements or proportions had been different, I think I might have gone with the custom option instead. There is no instruction manual included, but she has done an hour-long tutorial here on YouTube that walks you through every step of the way. So while my video is an aesthetic journey of the sewing process, hers will show you exactly what needs to happen when. And I am not ashamed to admit I kept her video pulled up during the entire sewing process just to make sure I got everything exactly right. I also watched through the video that Noelle of Costuming Drama did about her experience making the pattern, and the combination of these two videos did a fantastic job of alleviating the anxiety I was feeling about this project. So patterns in hand, most of my materials acquired, I was ready to jump right in. So before we go into the aesthetic journey, let me pass you off to Mockup Lydia for some notes. Behold, my mockup. This is as cut out from the pattern zero alterations and guys um i think i just made a corset i could honestly put binding on the top and bottom here and wear this out i am very happy with how this turned out and the fact that i don't really have to do all that much of anything this is so close. The biggest issue I noticed was actually at the back with the two rows of boning that support the lacing and when a corset fits right it is supposed to sit parallel and mine was not sitting parallel it was bowing outwards and at first I went oh no what's going on and then I went hold up. So for this mock-up I am using industrial zip ties for the boning instead of the synthetic baleen that I'm going to use on the actual corset. And what I figure is that the zip ties just aren't strong enough to handle the stress of lacing in that place. Because I took a pair of steel bones that I had from an old fast fashion corset that I had taken apart for parts and stuck that in and as you can see there is no bowing it is sitting perfectly parallel it instantly improved the silhouette i love it so no changes needed there the other change is up at the top here the pretty housemaid corset is a mid bust corset this is without any trimming off this is the pattern plus seam allowance and I find it sitting just a little bit too low for my personal comfort. So I'm going to add some fabric up at the top and then once it's all assembled I can look at it, try it on and determine how much do I want to trim off. But you know this is 
quite lovely. I had originally planned to do just a single layer mock-up. Morgan Donner has a video on different corset mock-ups, so I was gonna go with the fast and simple one layer way. And then I went, um, and exactly how many boned garments have you made in your life? Do it properly. And I am so glad I did. It gave me a lot of confidence. It took away that last little bit of fear that I still had lingering around about this project and instead it made me excited. I will stop ambling and rambling and we will get on to making this corset for real. Adjustments to the pattern made, it was time to cut out the fabric. I'm using an ivory silk for the outer fashion fabric and a beige cotton canvas for the inner strength layer. Pins can subtly change the layout of the fabric and on a corset you want pieces to be cut out precisely so instead I used my favorite shiny rocks to hold the pattern pieces down. I needed two pieces of every pattern piece cut out, and again, to make sure it was precise, I cut the pieces out individually instead of on the fold. Because a lot of the pieces are similar in shape, I knew inevitably I would mix something up, so I numbered them all just on the edge of the seam allowance, both sides A and B. Because this corset has cording, it's important to cut out extra seam allowance, or the fabric will shift as you cord, and your outer fabric will potentially end up shorter than your seam allowance. To make things easier, I marked in all my seam allowances ahead of time, as well as the cording and boning channels on the silk side. Then it was time to put the busk in. I marked where I wanted to start the busk, as well as either side of each hook, so I would know where to start and stop sewing. I thought about using a matching thread for the machine sewn parts, but decided to go instead with a contrasting light blue to add a pop of color. The pin side of the bus gets sewn straight down the whole way. The hook side of the bus gets sewn between the marks, and because my antique machine doesn't have a backstitch feature, I decided to just pull the fabric out a bit and not cut the thread at all until the end. After pressing the front pieces open and crisp, I put the busk in, which was a slightly fiddly process. I carefully pinned the busk in place to keep it from wiggling away. I matched the two front pieces together and marked in the center of each hook. This made a guide for the pin side. To set in the pin side, a hole is made with an awl and the busk is gently pushed through. The busk can be sewn in by machine, but I wasn't a fan of the idea of putting this under my antique machine, so I basted it in place and then stitched it in by hand instead. 10 out of 10, no regrets. Then it was time to start the cording, and I had experimented in the mock-up stage with my antique machine, my modern brother machine's regular sewing foot, and a modern zipper foot. Of all three options, I surprisingly ended up liking the results from my modern machine best. So a little anachronistic, yes, but I'm happy, so ultimately that's all that matters. For the cording, I used waxed cotton cord. I do like the support this gives, although you do need to make sure not to have your iron on too high a heat going forward. Ask me how I know. The cording gets sandwiched right between the two layers of fabric, pushed right up to the edge, and then it gets stitched as close to the cording as possible. This was the part of the project where I started grinning, because look at it! It looks like the start of a corset! Moving on to the side pieces, these get attached with what Michelle calls a sandwich method. She describes it better than I do, but basically the way you sew the layers together ends up enclosing the raw edges without having to finish them. The pieces get sewn together, and as you see here, the raw edges are totally enclosed. Then starts lots of careful pressing. First flat, 
And then you should use a tailor's ham to press the curves into the shape they'll end up being. I still haven't gotten around to finding a tailor's ham, so I used the next best thing. Crocheted Serenity, which has a pretty close enough shape. The seam is top stitched into place, and another row of stitches is added to make a boning channel. And to illustrate how much of the hourglass shape comes from the shape of the fabric itself, this is without any boning or cording in place yet. Now we add cording on the side pieces. And I switch to using a soft nail tool to push the cording in place. Cording all set, the hip pieces get added, sandwiched to the side pieces so the raw edges get enclosed. A quick set of stitches to hold the hip pieces in place, and then begins rows and rows and rows and rows of cording. Once the panels are fully corded, the extra fabric can be cut off and tidied up. Then we can sandwich the back side pieces to the side pieces. Careful pressing to open the seams out, and top stitching to hold the layers down. The more I use my antique machine, the more I enjoy the level of control I get. It's actually more precise than what I get from my modern machine. And back for some more cording. The center back pieces get a straight seam, and the extra silk fabric will get folded with the seam allowance to add a little bit of extra support to the grommets. A good press to make the edge crisp, and then three lines get added, for two boning channels and space for the grommets in between. The center back and fronts get pinned to the side pieces, pinning everything except one layer of silk. The edges of silk that were left free gets folded under to enclose the raw edges and form the final boning channels. It is important that this gets pinned following the natural curve of the corset, otherwise it won't sit right once it's sewn together. two halves complete, it's time to bind the edges. Modern corsets usually use bias binding, but historical corsets often use straight grain binding. This is because bias binding takes up a lot more fabric, and historically fabric was expensive, and they wouldn't want to throw away excess material if they didn't have to. The binding is sewn down by machine on the right side of the fabric, then the seam allowance is trimmed to about a quarter inch, and then folded under twice and sewn down by hand. Let's talk briefly about the busk. The original Pretty House made corset had what is known as a spoon busk because it looks like, well, a spoon. You can get reproductions of these, but Michelle points out that the modern reproductions are heavier and just not as nice as the historical versions. So I opted for her choice, which is just a basic straight busk. 
Now, Victorian corset busks often had a bit of a curve below the waist, as they recognized that the vast majority of women don't actually have flat torsos. This gave a little bit of room for the tummy and made for a nice, smooth silhouette. To get that curve, you can literally just bend your busk by hand. I held it over one hand and bent it with the other, and that gave a gentle, subtle curve. And then it was time to add the boning. The steel bones for the back support are super easy, so they get inserted first. Okay, before we go any further, we need to clear one thing up. People who aren't in the historical costume community, when they hear steel-boned corset, think tough, rigid, immovable, bones made out of steel. That is not the case. This is a flat steel bone for a corset. It can do this. It can do that. It can even go wub wub if you wanted to. This is not rigid. This is not immovable. This is steel boning. There is also spiral steel boning, which gives a lot more flexibility. But for this corset, I'm going to be using two sets of steel boning only at the back. Also, people hear whalebone and think bones from whales. Hard bone. No. Whalebone is actually the baleen from baleen whales, which is the toothy part right at the front, which is actually made of keratin, which is the same material as your fingernails. Are your fingernails rigid and immovable? And that is what whalebone corsets were lined with. This is synthetic baleen. It is plastic, but it is also bendable and behaves like baleen because Obviously, with the ending of the whaling industry, we cannot get actual baleen anymore. So this is the next best thing, and you can tell, it be bendy. This is not rigid. This is not immovable. <laughs> it's comfortable. So, steel bones, they bendy. Synthetic baleen, also bendy and springy. This is not going to be a rigid, immovable corset. As mentioned, I'm using synthetic baleen for the majority of the boning. This is designed to mimic the weight and properties of real baleen, and is a popular choice among historical costumers. As recommended, I'm cutting my bones one inch shorter than the boning channels to allow for seam allowance and a bit of give. You don't want the bones right up against the binding at either end. This is a stiffer material than what I've used before, so I figured my old nail file wouldn't quite cut it for filing away the rough edges. So instead, I ventured outside with my trusty Dremel. Yes, I kept my fingers out of the way. Once all the edges were rounded, I went back over them all with a bit of sandpaper to smooth out any rogue rough bits that were left. I hadn't thought about ironing my bones, but it actually makes a lot of sense. You just make sure the iron is on low and you keep it moving. Then when the bone is warm, you can shape or flatten it how you like. These are unironed bones, and these are the ironed bones. Just a little bit of difference. Then the bones can get slid into the channels, and I did my best to go from side to side, mirroring which channel I was working on to prevent confusion. With all the boning in, the top edge gets its binding in the exact same way as the bottom edge. And that, friends, is what I call winning thread chicken. To add a bit of frill at the top, I took this narrow silk ribbon and threaded it through my lace trim, both bought on my recent New York adventure. Then the lace gets pinned on the top, starting just past the grommets to prevent the lace getting caught in the lacing when it gets worn. This was also very handy, as this is all I have left of the lace. Measure before you buy, I guess? I just did a basic running stitch along the top edge to fasten it down, going through all the layers of binding and fabric. And then, just to make sure it sat flat, I ran a quick running stitch just below the ribbon as well. 
The end is in sight, and the next step is to add the grommets. First, I marked out the spaces using the pattern as my guide. Then I marked the diameter of the grommet hole and snipped it out. Ideally, you would want to use an awl to push the fibers aside, as cutting the fabric weakens it, but I haven't had luck with that in the past, so cutting it is. I was a little apprehensive about this stage, as I haven't had 100% success with grommets in the past, and that's kind of a crucial step here. But I did a couple of practice runs and it worked well, so I just dived right in. The first ones were ever so slightly wonky, but I definitely improved in both skill and speed as I went on. It was rather finicky at first, and I had to laugh as I was working because this setup felt like I was doing surgery on my corset. Scalpel. Scissors. Grommet. Hammer. Success, Doctor. So I will admit that not every single grommet is exactly perfect, but as long as it does the job it is supposed to do, I am allowing myself to not beat myself up about it. This project definitely taught me a lot about letting go and embracing historical imperfection. We have this idea in our heads, at least I did, that everything sewn historically looked perfect. It's not. When you look closely at historical garments, there are a lot of imperfections. From seam edges left raw, to piecing, to uneven stitches, imperfections abound. And while I was looking at Symington corsets for inspiration for the next and final stage of this project, I took a close look at one of the boning channels and realized that it was not super even, and that in fact resembled a seam line I had sewn and that I was slightly beating myself up about. So if the Symington company can sew a corset, it with slightly uneven seam lines, I can be nice to myself about little bitty mistakes too. And at this point, it is 100% wearable. You could lace it up and call it quits right here. But I wasn't quite ready to. Historically, most corsets in this era had what is known as flossing. This was decorative but also functional embroidery that both looks beautiful and holds the boning in place, keeping it from sliding around in the channels. Flossing could range from just very simple X's or teardrop shapes, all the way to incredibly intricate designs with flowers, feathers, and more. Since this is my first time trying flossing, I went with a fairly straightforward crisscross pattern, stitching at the bottom of the corset on every boning channel. And with that, the corset is complete. It gets laced up at the back and is ready to wear. So, in conclusion, I made a Victorian corset, and it looks like the real deal. I am so unbelievably proud of how this turned out. It is better than I imagined when I first started thinking about making my first historical corset. There are some projects I've made where I've hit a certain point and I can see it coming together, and I can't stop grinning and giving a happy little 
giggle whenever I look at it. This is one of these projects. It was about halfway through when the cording was in and the side pieces were sewn together and it was just like, I'm doing the thing and the thing looks good and it looks like it's how it's supposed to. And that is such a satisfying feeling, knowing that your hard work and research is paying off and the end result is exactly what you wanted. It is also quite comfortable, different from other undergarments and different from other corsets I've worn before. In fact, I may give this a try underneath my Kaylee shindig dress and see if and how it improves the silhouette, but it is comfy, it is bendable, it is supportive, and awesome. I will definitely use this pattern again. I can see myself experimenting with some other funky color combos down the road. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and if you would like to see more Geekery Meets History sewing adventures, please hit the subscribe button and stick around. And for those who have stuck around to the very end of this video, I have a little announcement. After a number of people requested this, I have officially launched a coffee account. Coffee is a super easy way to support content creators, and unlike Patreon, which is a monthly subscription, coffee is a one-time donation. So you can literally buy your favorite creator a coffee. I am slowly but surely getting closer to the fabled goal of monetization, but in the meantime, if you would like to help grow this channel and support future projects, there is a link in the description below where you can buy me a coffee. And if coffee isn't your gem, just watching this video and other videos on my channel will help this lovely community of friends to grow. I hope you stick around, I have a lot more adventures planned. In the meantime, if you have a project that currently feels insurmountable, take heart, go forth, and do the scary but exciting thing. It may just turn out more epic than you imagined. I made a Victorian corset! That is not flattering! My chair is doing a squeaky thing again. Ah, are you trying to be helpful? What are you doing? Are you helping to film? You're being a booker. Are you a helpful puppy? Can I put the corset on you?